Yeah. Okay, hello everyone, and thanks a lot for being here. My name is Javier Jorquera Copier. I am an energy analyst at the International Energy Agency, specifically at the Renewables Integration and Secure Electricity Unit. And I'm very happy to be the moderator of this event uh, today with all of you. This event is called Electric Vehicles, Total Cost of Ownership and Grid Integration Tools. And we will explore uh, two different tools that the IEA uh, produced uh, in recent times. Before we begin, I will give a, a couple of uh, important information for this event. First, uh, I am showing here uh, this slide of a disclaimer for interpretation. Um, we will have today interpretation from English to French. And then you should know that in the uh, questions and answers part of each presentation of each of the two tools we will present, we will have uh, the opportunity to answer your questions. And these questions can be preferably in English, but you can also post them in French if that's better for you. Also, I would like to let you know that this session is being recorded. The terms uh, of the data protection notice can be found in our website where we have created a page for this uh, event today. So, outline today we will begin uh, with having uh, opening remarks by Annika Berlin and Pablo Ediakov. Annika Berlin is the Africa Platform Coordinator and also Program Management Officer of the Sustainable Mobility Unit, Industry and Economy Division of the United Nations Environment uh, Program. And Pablo Eriakov is uh, the head of the Renewables Integration and Secure Electricity in, uh, Unit in the International Energy Agency, the IEA. After this, after their opening remarks, we will have a presentation of uh, Shane McDonald, the Transport Analyst of the Technology Innovation Unit of the Energy Technology a technology policy division of the IEA. He will present to us the electric vehicles total cost of ownership tool. Then we, he will have a questions and answers uh, section to answer all the questions you may have about his presentation. Then I, I myself will present uh, the electric vehicle charging and grid integration interactive web tool. And I also, after my presentation, will have another session to answer all of our, your questions. And then we will wrap up the event. So, that, so, we can go uh, to the opening remarks. And Annika, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, Javier. And thanks especially to the International Energy Agency for organizing this exciting event and for presenting uh, their tools. It's been a, a great partnership between UNEP and IEA to offer these sort of events. Um, just like briefly as a, as a reminder why, why we're talking about this topic. Um, so uh, as, as, as most of you know in the webinar, you know, the, the transport sector is increasingly moving towards electric um, vehicles for five main reasons. One being uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transport, which um, continue to be a quarter of all energy related uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally. A second, and in many parts of Africa, most importantly, to reduce air pollution. Uh, which causes uh, um, respiratory diseases. Uh, third, um, to increase, uh, to reduce costs from increasing price of importation of fossil fuels. Fourth, uh, increasing uh, urbanization, uh, which means that we need more efficient, uh, cleaner and sustainable means of transport. Uh, and fifth, uh, to create um, local value change around the assembly, manufacturing and maintenance of electric vehicles and green jobs. Uh, for example, also by using locally uh, generated electricity uh, that then can be used for uh, vehicles instead of importing fuels. And that is, of course, also part of this webinar, how we can use and better integrate renewable electricity in grids and vehicles. Um, it is estimated that by uh, 2035, uh, the main automotive uh, markets, uh, US, EU, uh, Japan and China are going to be moving to all electric vehicle sales. And that means uh, a few years later, uh, we will see these vehicles uh, on uh, the main importing markets that are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so why currently the number of vehicle, electric vehicles in Africa is still low, uh, the conditions are optimal um, to leapfrog to electric mobility by leveraging uh, renewable energy um, resources that are uh, abundant on the continent. And also um, from an economic perspective, the current rise in fossil fuel prices has uh, given governments the urgency to move uh, to more sustainable sources of energy uh, in mainly uh, importing markets. And under this background, uh, with funding from the Global Environmental Facility, 
Um, UNEP, together with partners such as the IEA, has established a global electric mobility program uh, where we're working um, in over 50 uh, low and middle income countries all over the world to um, help with the shift to electric mobility. Um, we are implementing grants from over 100 million US dollars and co-finance exceeding 500 million. The program is active on the global le level, such as with global tools that we present here, on the regional level with the Africa Support Investment Platform that we are coordinating from Nairobi, and where we try to offer um, as much support as possible through trainings, connecting with experts, financiers, uh, and uh, in general by establishing networks between people working in mobility on the continent. Um, and uh, part of this work, the connection between the regional and the global level is this webinar. We are trying to bring uh, the knowledge from the IEA uh, to the region. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to, to an active uh, exchange uh, within this webinar. And with that, um, I'll hand over back to um, Jovi. Many thanks. Thank you, Anika. Uh, now, Pablo, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Javier, and thank you so much, Ms. Annika Berlin, uh, our colleagues from the United Nations Environment Program Unit, and particularly to all of the colleagues that are joining us from different parts of Africa. It's really nice to be here speaking to you, and, and it's really nice. It's a pleasure to see how many participants we have from different places from the African continent. Today, Africa is a very important region in our work. Uh, we've been publishing several reports, such as the African Energy Outlook 2022, as well as a vision for clean cooking access for all in Africa that are specifically focused on the continent. And we're about to launch a report on financing clean energy in Africa in collaboration with the African Development Bank Group at the Climate Action Summit taking place in Nairobi next week. And really throughout these projects, what we have been doing is collaborating with key partners in the region, as well as discussing the size of the opportunities and challenges that African countries are facing in many topics related to energy and climate change. Another good news is that recently, Kenya and Senegal have joined the IA family, following in the footsteps of Morocco, South Africa, and Egypt. And this means further focus and continuation on increasing our collaboration with partners of the region. We're aiming to support Africa in achieving its own energy climate and climate related objectives, including of course, universal access to modern energy, as well as clean energy development. In the context of today's webinar, electric mobility, we see it playing a central role IA scenarios show that electric mobility can really enable deep decarbonization of the global energy system in an affordable manner, which is really important and key. Every region has distinct opportunities and challenges to tackle uh, the uptake of electric vehicles, and Africa is no exception in this case. One particular barrier that we've seen for electric mobility in Africa is, of course, the need to expand electricity access that today is only at an average electricity access rate of 57%. Another aspect is linked to affordability and, and the need to develop affordable vehicles as well as their operation. Despite these barriers, what we see is a great potential for an expansion of the electric vehicle market uh, in the region. And with the government's interest and efforts towards revision and regulations to support the uptake of electric vehicles in various African countries, this is a, a very strong path forward. To assist countries with the uptake of electric mobility, we have developed at the IA two interactive tools under the GIF program, the Global Environment Facility, Global E-Mobility Program. And during this workshop today, we're gonna to be presenting these tools as part of a series of regional dissemination events that began in April this year. The first tool is the Total Cost of Ownership tool, which allows to compare cost of owning and operating fossil fuel and electric vehicles. And that helps understanding under which conditions an electric vehicle can be more affordable to own than a fossil fuel based vehicle. And the second tool is the Electric Vehicle Charging and Grid Integration tool which allows to understand the impacts that different fleets and behavioral profiles can have on the power grids by simulating several charging strategies and fleet behavior. And this, of course, is going to be of high relevance for the development of the African power grids. To present these tools, I am very happy to introduce my colleagues Shane McDonough and Javier Jorquera. Uh, during this workshop, we're really looking forward to any questions and feedback from colleagues that are participating. We hope that the workshop today will contribute to supporting electric mobility deployment in Africa and our continued cooperation and collaboration with the region. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and the comments that we'll receive today. Thanks. Many thanks, Pablo and Anika, for your great opening remarks. Now I will hand over the floor to Shane to begin his presentation. Thank you, Javier. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, I just need to share my screen. So bear with me if things are a little bit messy at the start. Uh, I hope they run a bit smoother thereafter. Okay. 
Nice. So just a, a very, very brief presentation to get started, to give some context. So uh, my name is Shane McDonough. I'm an energy analyst here at the IEA, specifically looking at transport and also coordinating our work with the Global Environmental Forum, the e-mobility project. So working group one uh, specifically looks at light duty vehicles. Uh, we hope to expand um, the TCO tool and other tools into other areas in the future. But for now, the focus is quite firmly on that light duty vehicle segment. So we're talking about passenger vehicles and small vans. We don't right now have a focus on two and three wheelers. Um, but again, this is something we hope to expand into because we know it's particularly relevant um, for our Asian and African uh, colleagues. Um, my email address is there on the screen. I really encourage anyone who has any questions um, related to the presentation or even if they're somewhat tangential. So if you have any questions about transport and you think that the IA and our Jeff coordinators might be of help, please feel free to reach out to us at that email address. I'll also show it at the end of my presentation. So just really quickly, um, what we have here is a map of all of the countries that are participating in the GEF7 project. So this iteration of the Global Environment Forum. Um, and what we're trying to do is promote electromobility in these countries. And you can see that they cover pretty much every part of the world, uh, north to south, but there's a, a focus on developing economies. And we can see that the use cases uh, in these countries are obviously going to be quite, quite different. Um, our projects focus on a range of issues from policy making to trying to reduce the cost, to try and increase access. We look at, like we said, passenger vehicles uh, and buses. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and understand that the GEF uh, deals with a really wide variety of, of subjects with respect to electric mobility. Um, again, working group one, we're looking at light duty vehicles, that's myself. And then working group four, which is Javier and Pablo, uh, are looking at grid integration. So we have to essentially look at what is the most suitable vehicle, when is an electric vehicle more suitable than a fossil alternative, and then how best do we charge that, how do we integrate it into the existing electricity system. Um, <clears throat> with respect to this tool, what we're trying to do is, number one, make it applicable to a really wide range of users. So again, the GEF um, participants are quite um, diverse, even within Africa they're very, very diverse. Um, so we want to make this tool available to a really wide range of users. We don't want anyone to need technical expertise to be able to get some lessons from the tool. Um, we want to provide lots of learning opportunities. So again, people who are not very technically um, adept or people who are new to the subject should be able to come to this tool um, and get some really meaningful um, learnings from it. We need to understand the effect on policy. So. Um, many of us here are maybe, you know, tangential to policy, so we might be um, talking to policymakers at some stage, we might be asked to inform policymaking, but it's also super important that we understand um, the most effective ways to try and influence uh, and to try and increase the uptake of e-mobility. So, for example, if we had the choice between subsidizing a vehicle or, you know, investing in electricity infrastructure, uh, we should understand the effects that that has and specifically to kind of our use case. Uh, we want to make uh, people aware that the technology is improving. So if we uh, perform a calculation or model some um, analysis as of today, we know that the potentials for fossil fuel technology and for electric technologies are different. You know, Fossil fuel technologies are very mature and therefore they're unlikely to get very much better than what they are today. Whereas with electric technologies, we understand that they're relatively immature and there's lots of opportunities to try and improve them and to try and integrate them into the systems a little better. So the, the bulk of my presentation will actually be a demonstration of um, the tool itself. So fingers crossed this works. Javier, you might just let me know that people can still see my screen. No? Yes, we, we see your, your slides. <clears throat> The slides or the, the, the TCO tool? The slides at, at this moment. Okay, right. So I might have to just stop sharing and then reshare to make sure. Now, you can see yeah, the Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, Thanks. Okay. Um, 
So this is the TCO tool as it is available on the IA website. So we can share the link. Um, maybe if we want to even put it in, if someone wants to put it into the chat. Um, when you visit the webpage, this is exactly what you will see. And what we have is lots of information about, number one, what a TCO is. So a total cost of ownership analysis. What that does is it tries to calculate all of the different costs. So, for example, purchasing the vehicle, um, buying fuel or charging the vehicle, you know, maintenance. Uh, if you had to take out uh, some finance or a loan to, to purchase in the first place, puts all of those costs together and produces a single figure. And that can be in terms of the, uh, you know, for example, dollars per kilometer driven or dollars per year. Um, and what that does is it allows you to compare different cars of different characteristics. And it also allows you to compare them across different use cases. And in, when I say a use case, I might mean whether you drive 10,000 kilometers per year or 25,000 kilometers per year. Um, and if you use the vehicle, for example, for commercial purposes, if you're a taxi or if it's just for personal use. So TCO was a way to, to fairly compare different powertrains. Um, I won't go into too much detail on, on, on what's written on the page. What we have is some really useful context and, and some explainers. Um, firstly, what we have are some, uh, I would call them lessons or kind of helpful user guides. And I encourage everyone to, to use these because, again, the purpose of this tool is not necessarily to really accurately model anyone's situation. It's to impart principles and for the users to be able to understand what affects the costs of, of an electric vehicle. So I wouldn't necessarily come to the IES TCO tool trying to say how much would my vehicle cost if it was electric, how much would it cost if it was petrol. It's capable of that. But what's more important is that we understand the circumstances and the scenarios in which one might be more suitable than the other. And at what point in the future um, that kind of that change might happen. So maybe electromobility is, is more expensive than the fossil alternative today, but in the in the not too distant future it will be cheaper. And by playing with this tool, we'll also be able to understand, you know, what levers and how we can improve the, you know, the competitiveness and the uh, affordability of electric options. So our, our lessons here are, for example, you know, we're looking at a cumulative cost curve because this is important to understand how the results are shown. And um, we're looking at, for example, we have vehicle A, vehicle B, and we can see the point at which these lines intersect or cross over. That's when one becomes essentially cheaper than the other. Um, and with an electric vehicle, for example, we can understand that they're, they're more expensive up front. So to purchase the vehicle is more expensive. But because it's generally cheaper to charge an electric vehicle than it is to refuel a fossil fuel vehicle, there is a point in the future at which those costs, you know, um, intersect again. And so we can say in, in this example, you know, if we buy our car in 2022, by about 2029, um, vehicle A will be more expensive than vehicle B. So it's more cheaper to buy, it's cheaper to buy at the start, but by 2029, that has changed. So there's some dynamics happening here. And um, this is with respect to financing. So it gets a little bit complicated. That's why we have these lessons here. And again, I encourage anyone using the tool to go and check these out. But I'll briefly go uh, to what we have, which is our basic version. <clears throat> um, what we have, number one, is a list of example regions or countries in which the analysis is performed. When we change these, um, when we select different countries on the list, what happens is it changes the default values for, for example, a vehicle cost. So vehicles cost in general to different amounts of money in different countries. These are just examples. Uh, if you don't see your country there, that's no problem. What, what you can do is you can choose this custom option and with that custom option, you can model um, any country you want. So, for example, if you're in, I heard Kenya mentioned earlier, and you want to uh, model the difference between electromobility and perhaps diesel, that's possible using our custom option. We have two time horizons today being the, the relative or the kind of um, average cost of the, the vehicles today and also around 10 years from now. So we, we say around 10 years from now, because again, this isn't the aim of this tool is not to explicitly model any one um, situation, but to give us good ideas of how costs change over time and what effect that has on our total cost of ownership. We can change things like our driving distance. We have different vehicle types, small, medium, large, pickup trucks, 
SUVs. And we also then have, again, our powertrains. So powertrain, we mean how is the vehicle fueled? Where does the power come from? <clears throat> we have diesel, petrol, petrol hybrid. Petrol hybrid here is a, a mild hybrid. So essentially, we cannot plug this in. All of the energy ultimately comes from petrol. Um, people might be familiar here with the Toyota Prius, which is maybe the most famous hybrid car. And then we have a, a plug-in hybrid where uh, there's a small battery on board that you can charge from uh, a, a socket um, or a, a charging station on the road. And then we have battery electric, which is fully electric. I might just at this point um, say, uh, if people have questions throughout the presentation, it's perhaps more beneficial if you if you pull up your hand and you ask now. Uh, there is a Q and A session at the end of this, but if you have a question now, feel free to ask because it's better to answer it such that you understand the rest of the presentation rather than moving forward with maybe some of the people a little bit confused about something specific. But um, <clears throat> so the tool here, we have a couple of ways of showing our results. So we talked about that total cost of ownership. We have dollars per kilometer, dollars per year, the cumulative costs. So this is, you know, we've purchased our vehicle, um, you know, perhaps through financing. So we have a down payment of perhaps 10%. And then each year we spend money on things like maintenance and fuel until we reach a point in which our, our loan is paid off. So we're no longer paying the loan, we're just paying maintenance and fuel. And you can see here that the lines continue to change. We also have the breakdown of our total cost of ownership. And that's essentially gives you what chunk of the total costs are fuel purchase, our again maintenance, our financing. And if we go to the battery electric option, we can see here that the vehicle cost is much, much greater than it is in the petrol. But then if we look at, for example, you know, we have financing again because uh, a battery vehicle, battery electric vehicle is more expensive, it's more expensive there. But we, what we have then is a large chunk of our costs, our, our, our liquid fuel purchase, so our petrol in this case, or gasoline, sorry. And um, well, I'll switch back to this because one thing that's really beneficial about this tool is that it calculates in real time. Uh, we don't have to change all of our uh, inputs and then wait for a result. What we can do is, for example, uh, try and drag out those lessons, those important lessons. So the green line here is our battery battery electric vehicle. Our purple line is our petrol vehicle. If you hover your mouse over any point, you'll get the exact numbers. And what we see is if we're driving just 7,000 kilometers per year, the petrol vehicle has a much, much lower cost because it's cheaper to buy. Even though it's more expensive to run, we're not running it very often. And so the total costs of a petrol vehicle are much lower if you run a very small number of kilometers per year. But if we change this, if we go up to someone who drives an average of maybe, we can say quite high, you know, if you were doing a taxi job, 30,000 kilometers per year, you can see that that changes very significantly. And because the lines now intersect, because they cross over, we can see that actually within seven years, our battery electric option would have a lower total cost of ownership than our petrol option. So this is just one example of how we can change different parameters and see how it affects the costs. If we go to a petrol hybrid, we can see here that it actually becomes, you know, that the costs are very, very similar to a battery electric, but because an electric vehicle is more efficient, it uses less, it spends less money on fuel, it would actually be better than a petrol hybrid in this circumstance. Likewise, we can look at plug-in hybrids, we can look at diesels, one thing that's important with the with the plug-in hybrid is we also need to know because the plug-in hybrid has the ability to run on purely electric or on petrol or a mix. Um, you need to know what share of your journeys are being covered by um, the pure electric mode. And you can see here, th this is the difference maybe between someone who lives quite close to work, to school, to the shops, where most of their journeys can be run on that small battery or if they do a lot of motorway driving, um, it's quite different. So we can see here, there's, there's lots of ways to, to change. Um, we can also change, for example, the electricity costs. You know, for, it makes a lot of sense. If the electricity cost is much higher, it makes our battery electric vehicle less competitive. Um, 
Likewise, if our uh, liquid fuel costs are higher, we can see that it has a huge effect on the competitiveness of our fossil auction. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, and I really, I use the word play with the tool. And I really, I, I mean that like the, the best thing to do is to play around with the options. And it, then you start to understand the effect that different changes have. So I think it makes sense to everybody that if the fuel costs are higher for one rather than the other, that will have an effect on competitiveness. But by playing with these sliders here and inserting different values that might be kind of more relevant to your country, you can see what kind of effect that would have. Really quickly then, I'm going to show you the advanced version. So these are the, the simple inputs that we give to users, um, and we expect most of them to be able to, to use this version um, without much technical know-how. But in our advanced version, we offer much, much more control over the, the specific kind of circumstances that you, you model. So you can uh, put in uh, specific vehicle costs, uh, what we have here is before taxes, you know, and this allows you to, for example, uh, if you're testing um, different policies, you know, what might it be better to reduce the purchase taxes or to reduce the fuel taxes? And you can play around with those different things here. So we have import tax, registration, CO2. And um, what we do here is we compare vehicles on a, on a 10 year basis. And um, because petrol, diesel, electric, all have different lifetimes. It can be different to, to compare them kind of evenly and fairly. And um, so what we did was we took a, a 10 year time frame because this is about the upper end of what we expect um, battery electric, first generation battery electric vehicles to operate for. After this, uh, what tends to happen is not that they get less efficient as what happens with uh, fossil fuel vehicles. What happens then is that the range reduces. So if your new battery electric vehicle can run for, for example, 400 kilometers on one charge, after 10 years, that figure might be as low as maybe 250 or 300 kilometers. Second generation and maybe more expensive battery electric vehicles, that reduction is much, much lower. Uh, and there are new regulations in place to kind of limit how, how small or how big of a drop that is after a number of years. But in general, we expect battery electric vehicles to have a lower range after 10 years, whereas we expect petrol and diesel vehicles to consume more fuel and require more maintenance after 10 years. So you can change the what we call the residual value. This is how much we expect a vehicle to be worked after 10 years. You can change that here. It doesn't really have a large effect <clears throat> because, excuse me, Relative to the cost of a, a new vehicle, we understand ourselves that you generally only get about 10 to 15% of the value of a car back when you sell it, especially after you've driven it for 10 years or more. With respect to operating costs, then we have lots and lots of different uh, parameters here. I won't go through them all, but some of the most important ones, again, are fuel cost, you know, and how much of that is tax. That changes significantly by country, particularly in Africa. Uh, we have the fuel efficiency. So the liters of fuel uh, required per 100 kilometers, or in the case of electric vehicles, the number of kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. You know, so if we made our electric vehicle really inefficient, we can see here um, the, the change. If we made our uh, fossil fuel vehicle much more efficient, we can see the change. We have th things here like the share of day charging, share of night charging. It's a small bit more complex, but again, what I do, what I do is I invite anyone here to play around with the tool, and then if you have specific questions, reach out to us at our email address, and we can help you. Something really important uh, to understand, again, particularly with respect to that kind of policy making element, is the effect of financing. So if you, <clears throat> if you're uh, borrowing money to purchase an electric vehicle, even though the operating costs are lower. So the operating costs, uh, and we have these kind of like information bubbles throughout. So if you if you if you get stuck for information, you can click on any of these. The operating costs is the the sum of fuel maintenance, all these different. Is that someone there? Sorry. No. Um. What we can see is if you're if you're paying a, a lot of money on on interest rates for your loans. That can wipe out a lot of the savings um, due to lower operating costs from a battery electric vehicle. So if I was a policymaker and I was playing with this tool, 
one of the things that I would hope I would take home is that rather than offering subsidies on the cost of a vehicle, an alternative option might be cheap financing. And so, for example, I'm looking here at my battery electric auction. If I had a low interest rate, we can see that it has a huge effect on the competitiveness. You know, so um, arguably the interest rate of the loan has a much greater effect on the cost than you know the fuel efficiency of the vehicle or even often the, the cost of the fuel you know um likewise if uh, if i was saving and i was making a commercial decision so if i wanted to purchase a taxi <clears throat> uh, maybe i was riding uber or something like that if i had a lot of money saved up and rather than taking out a loan i just paid a higher deposit we can see that it has a big impact on the costs so paying for your vehicle in cash can actually save you more money than, for example, buying a more expensive vehicle that has a, a lower energy requirement. Um, hopefully a lot of this makes sense. If not, uh, I know we were a small bit behind time, so I'm happy to jump into the Q&A session right now. Uh, and fingers crossed there's a couple of questions. So I'm maybe going to leave my screen as is, or have you, you can tell me uh, what you'd prefer. But I'm happy to start taking some questions now. Yeah, thanks. You, you can leave it there if you want. Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe um, Jason or someone, uh, is someone maybe moderating this that they can unmute people? It would be great if people could ask their question because I'm always sure that if, 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 if one person has the question, I'm sure many people do. Yeah. Um, we'll start with the question from Kevin. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Anik and Shen. So my question will be, okay, in terms of total cost of ownership, whereby you've showed us uh, the graph, the point of parity, can this be the point where you know that now uh, it's time whereby uh, a reader can, like, like us, we do a leasing model, Point of parity can can it be at the point where a reader can be the owner of the bike now and us consider it it's a point where we should have now the total cost of uh, returns in terms of uh, the way the investment cost sorry thank you I think that, that's a really good question and I think the easiest way to to think about that crossover point or that point of parity is is the year in which the costs of the both powertrains equal right. And if one is increasing faster than the other, uh, so for example, um, the costs of a fossil fuel vehicle tend to increase more rapidly than a battery electric because petrol and diesel tend to be more expensive than electricity. And you, you can say, if I own my electric vehicle for that many years, that's how many years I need to, to drive it for it to pay itself off. You often hear that term. So basically, um, at that crossover point, every year thereafter, I'm saving money driving an electric vehicle compared to a fossil fuel. I hope I hope that makes sense. So the, the parity or the crossover point is the year in which the total cost of ownership is equal. And then if you look at the trends, basically every year after that, I'm saving money compared to the alternative. So um, what I would do is, for example, if that crossover point didn't happen until year 15, I would probably look at a battery electric vehicle and I would say, um, it, I need to drive this for at least 15 years before I save money compared to petrol. I don't think this car will last that long. The other way to look at it then is if that crossover point is at, at year four, for example, you can say, okay, my electric vehicle should last at least 10 years. So for six of those 10 years, I'm saving money compared to my fossil fuel vehicle. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Maybe I could share my screen again and it might, uh, you know, seeing an example might be helpful. <clears throat> now, so if uh, I hope people can see again. So what we're looking at here is in year three, you know, the costs of the petrol vehicle become greater than the costs of the battery electric. So for every year after <clears throat> year three, I'm saving money compared to if I bought an electric car. Now, if I drive 
uh, much fewer miles, you know. Uh, that doesn't happen until year six, you know. So the, the savings will be much, much lower by the end of year 10. And if I if I drive even fewer kilometers, these lines don't intersect. And so I, I basically am driving enough kilometers in a year to enjoy the benefits of an electric vehicle. Um, and again, guys, if you have any more questions or if that doesn't make sense, I encourage you, number one, to play around with the tool, to, to mess with the different things like costs and number of kilometers per year, and then come back to us uh, with questions. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Hi, Shane. Can we take one more question from Brian? Yeah. Yes, I uh, will take the question from Brian. You're muted, Brian, so perhaps you need to unmute yourself and then um, ask aloud. Hello, sorry, Shen. You can hear me now? I can. Thank you. Um, quite a good presentation, and I love the tool. Though I have one suggestion. In future iterations, could you possibly consider incorporating local currency as well? Because the way I look at it, the information is more beneficial to the end user. So they'll have much more confidence when they can compare like for like. Yeah. this uh, That's a great question. And this is something that we grappled with when we were building the tool. And we, we can install an API that would uh, kind of automatically, I would say, um, convert from one currency to the next. But the issue we had was um, kind of finding data for those countries uh, was quite difficult. Excuse me. And then converting, say, vehicle costs in particular became an issue. So we decided that to, in order to keep it simple, and to make sure that the lessons were not lost. So again, the, the most important part of this tool is, is that we understand, like for example, I talked about um, how um, favorable financing conditions, so lower interest rates, higher down payments, actually does more to reduce the cost of your electric vehicle than for example, if somebody gave me a purchase subsidy or offered me 15% lower fuel costs, you know? So the, these kind of trade-offs and policy implications were the main focus of the tool. And if we included currency exchanges, which, which we weren't you know, very confident about, and the changes in vehicle costs, all this started to make it a little bit more complex. And um, so it was decided not to include it for this version. But if, if we can think of a way to include currency conversions, make it more relevant to the specific users, uh, I think we'll do that in the future. Thank you. Fireheads. So Shane, we have two questions in the question Q and A box. Could you kindly address them as well? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll answer those. Well. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so I'll just answer it. Uh, sorry, Adipoho, if I if I'm getting that right, or Adipoju, um. I'll, I'll get to your question in just a second, but how, um, this user asks, how long do the batteries of electric cars last and can they be replaced once they failed to hold charge long enough? Um, this is, um, you know, what, oh, it's gone again. Long story short is the batteries don't tend to fail. You know, what we do is we experience a reduction in range over the years. And um, that is, tends to be for first generation cars around seven years with, you know, when someone is driving an average of, of 20,000 kilometers per year. Um, but it doesn't mean that the car fails. It just means that, you know, if you were to fully charge your electric vehicle and drive it all the way until the battery runs empty, that you'll have covered fewer kilometers than you would have in year one. We can also replace individual cells. So uh, the battery is not just one big solid battery. It's made up of lots of individual small batteries. And uh, rather than them all fail at the same time, what tends to happen is individual pieces fail. And currently they can be replaced 
it's not very, very easy on, on older electric vehicles, but newer electric vehicles are being manufactured to make that process more easy. <clears throat> and as I said, um, newer regulations are in place to try and make the life of those batteries even longer. So if we looked at, if we if you asked me that question seven or eight years ago, and the answer could have been as little as five years, you know, and after five years, the, the battery would have been, you know, not very good. It would have been difficult to live with, but technology is improving so quickly that, you know, a, a, an electric vehicle lasting for 10 years plus is, is going to be a regular occurrence uh, going forward. I actually didn't get a chance to read the second question, um, but it, like maybe a little bit more on that is just, we, we expect that uh, you can replace, you'll be able to replace the battery in an electric vehicle somewhat similar to you replace the engine in your fossil fuel vehicle. You know, it's the most expensive component, but once you replace it, you have close to a, a new vehicle. Um, so anyone with their hand up, uh, I can take one more question for sure. I don't want to go too far over time. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. So thanks for the presentation, Shane. And, and the tool is just a wonderful tool to actually look at. But I'm um, Hadeek Bajum calling from, I'm speaking from Nigeria, and I'm actually looking at the context of the tool in application to the multiple variations, you know, that is so frequent that we have the cost of a petrol and also in terms of the local currency exchange rate, you know, Yes, the advantage might be to those that have a stable currency in terms of dollars, but looking at the local currency where we cannot determine prices, most especially for imported products. So how, how best can this guide our actions, you know, in the procurement of batteries? And also, is this is a question I've also been asking all the way from Africa, that is there any country in Africa or any of it or has ever used a battery for seven years. How long do we know that this battery is going to last us for seven years? Because looking at the electric vehicle, one of the most important part of it is the battery and mostly in terms of cost. So I, I don't know how the, your tool can actually help or guide us in this in relation to the cost. Thank you. Right. I apologize if I maybe misinterpret your question, but there's two things here is about that currency and informing decisions. So this tool is primarily a way to compare different powertrains. And so whether you're comparing them in US dollars or, you know, South African Rand, um, if one is better than the other, and then you convert uh, from US dollars into Rand, for example, one will still be better than the other. So if, if you if you start off using this tool as a way to compare you know diesel versus petrol hybrid and you find out that diesel is better in the situation that you modeled well then when you convert those both into your local currency diesel will still be better you know and then if you compare diesel to battery electric you might find that battery electric is is better so uh, i totally understand that looking at answers in us dollars might not uh, ring so many bells or it might be difficult but if you start and try and find which option is best for you and then just convert your, your winning option into your local currency, that's maybe a good place to start. With respect to uh, how it informs uh, decisions on batteries. So uh, for sure, the battery cost is, is the largest part of the, the vehicle cost with respect to uh, battery electric vehicles in the same way that the engine and the drivetrain are the most expensive component of a fossil fuel vehicle. I think really, um, as an individual purchasing batteries or purchasing a battery electric vehicle, there's not a huge amount you can do to influence the, those costs. What you can do is look at the the, the cost of, of the vehicle you're looking at. You can look at the, the energy efficiency. So how many kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers it uses. Use that information to feed into the, the tool. And then compare it to, you know, your petrol option, which will, again, have a cost and have a, a litres 
of fuel per 100 kilometers. And by taking those real world values, so for example, if I looked at, you know, uh, I'm going to say a Ford Focus, and I took the values from the electric option and from the, the petrol option, and I fed them into the tool, I can get a good idea of which one would cost me more money over time. Um, with, uh, what I do then is is uh, we have some other tools coming out in the future about life cycle assessments, which dig deeper specifically into that battery cost uh, and maybe the life cycle assessment kind of nature of it. So if you want to write your questions down in an email and send it to me, I can give you a more detailed response and maybe point you towards some reports we've done in the past. Thank you, Shane. Uh, would you be okay? Because I, I see that there are some uh, more open questions, but we're a bit uh, late scheduled. So would you mind uh, maybe the questions you find appropriate and you can answer answering them uh, written uh, in the Q&A box? Sounds good. Okay, Perfect. I'll have a look at you. Thanks very much, Javier. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Shane, for the great presentation. And also for the questions to all our, all our audience members. Okay, so now I will share my screen. This is... Bear with me for a second and let me confirm. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. There, can you see it? Perfect. So as said before, uh, the same format as Shane had, I will uh, present uh, uh, give, give a brief overview of the tool and some background uh, uh, of it relates to some important topics on it uh, on the aspect of EV electric vehicle charging and grid integration. So, if you have a pressing question that you think is making you very difficult to understand and follow the rest of the presentation, please raise your hand. But otherwise, please write the questions in the Q and A uh, box, and I will answer them after I finish my my demonstration. So, yeah, uh, thanks again for. For joining today, as I was saying, my name is Javier Jorquera Copier. I'm an energy analyst at the Renewable Integration and Secure Electricity Unit. And I will present to, to you the electric vehicle charging and grid integration tool, which was developed uh, under the collaboration of the International Energy Agency with the Global Environment Facility Project, uh, specifically under the Working Group 4. And I also left there my email so that you can contact me uh, as in, in case of any question or also if you have any suggestion that you, or, or an idea that you think could, could be good to improve this tool. So the other one for, for this presentation is first, I will discuss a bit about grid integration of electric vehicles based on a report that our team published in 2022, which is a manual for policymakers on how to better make use of the opportunities that the grid integration schemes provide. Second, I will give some context of the electric vehicle charging and grid integration tool. And I will also do a live demonstration of it. And then I will follow suit with the uh, questions and answers uh, session. So first, a bit about what the goal of this manual is, uh, and also why grid integration is an important topic that we should be talking about, regardless of whether a country or even a, on a sub-national level, a city, uh, if it has a lot or very little amount of EVs. I think throughout all of the stages of development, this is very important to, to, to take into account. So the goal with this uh, report that was the Manual for Policymakers and Grid Integration of Electric Vehicles was to help policymakers to make sense of all the information around grid integration of electric vehicles and also to create a step-by-step -step guide that can also help policymakers and also the broader public to understand how to prioritize policies according to their own local context. We think this can be useful to countries in all stages of electric vehicle deployment, regardless if they have just a couple of electric vehicles in their fleet or already a large scale deployment. Um, and that's why we think this is a very uh, important uh, uh, report to present to you today as context. So grid integration can be understood as the process of adapting power system operations to accommodate the entry of new energy technologies such as electric vehicles, always trying to maintain a cost-effective operation, that is to make sure that they are integrated to the power system, minimizing the costs as much as possible. So why is it important to ensure an adequate integration? 
This is because excessive demand of electricity can cause several issues. I will name just a couple. For example, uh, we could have power outages or blackouts in certain parts of the network if the electricity demand at a specific moment is too much for the local network infrastructure to, to manage, to handle. Second, also we uh, see that potentially uh, because of additional electricity demand caused by electric vehicle charging, uh, this could translate into um, possibly increased power generation from fossil fuel based uh, plants, such as a coal fired power plant. This would lead in many cases, the electricity costs to increase in that system. And also in turn, it could uh, lead to higher uh, carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions. All of this can have uh, negative impacts on both the system, but also very importantly on uh, consumers of this uh, area. So these are some reasons why we believe that grid integration is a very important topic that we should be thinking very carefully and working towards doing it properly. So in the report, uh, we have a, a summary of four steps that uh, policymakers uh, sh should uh, follow to su successfully integrate electric vehicle storage systems. First, uh, one of the steps is for the uh, electric mobility transition. This relates to engage electric mobility stakeholders. So not only ministries of energy should be involved, but also, for example, all of the ministries that oversee uh, a lot of the uh, government agencies that oversee infrastructure development, like for example, in cities or even at the national level, also transport uh, entities should be involved. And that way, through all of the collaboration and information sharing of all stakeholders, the silos can be broken, uh, both in planning and also in policy making. A second aspect is very important, uh, regardless as I was saying, if there's little or uh, a lot of electric vehicles, to assess the power system impacts that electric vehicles could have. So first, many countries have defined an electric mobility strategy. For example, in many cases, they set targets of how many electric buses or electric cars they could have in a certain year. And this can give an idea of where the country is heading to, under which idea that the country can prepare for. Then also the country can gather data and develop insights, for example, collect data to understand what are the driving patterns of different type of users, for example, truck drivers or also uh, private uh, car drivers. And combining all of this, the countries can assess the grid impacts under various mobility scenarios. For example, they could do several scenarios to uh, assess if there, what happens to the grid if there's more, like let's say 1,000 electric buses in a city, or what happens if there's 2,000 or 1,000, and what these differences uh, mean in, in terms of planning. Third, Policymakers can deploy measures for grid integration. For example, they, they can ensure to accommodate all types of charging solutions. For example, a smart charging on different ways. I will explain a bit more on this later. Uh, but the idea that we suggest is that whenever possible, they should always aim to deploy smarter uh, or more flexible ways of charging electric vehicles. Then Policymakers can also facilitate aggregation by enforcing standards and interoperability, for example, ensuring that the type of charger, the adapter is common so that the same user can use several different uh, charging locations to charge their vehicle. Also to value the flexibility of electric vehicles in terms of the flexibility they can provide, for example, by changing when they charge and therefore modifying the, the demand of the system. And also, uh, Policymakers could benefit from, for example, coordinating EV charging with renewable generation and incentivizing smart readiness. For example, making sure that the technologies to facilitate smart charging are in place uh, increasing, increasingly in the country. And lastly, uh, we, we think that policymakers could also benefit from improving planning practices, for example, conduct, conducting proactive risk planning, that is, not waiting to see when uh, a several a large fleet of electric vehicles connect, but rather to try to anticipate when this could happen and to which extent, and also to fully reflect the value of electric vehicle charging by, as, as, as I was saying, uh, trying to uh, recognize the value, for example, of flexible charging uh, under various uh, smart charging schemes. So also very important to mention is that uh, continuing to the point that 
every country will have a bit of a different starting point and also different opportunities and challenges. Uh, so that's in our estimates, we see that various countries have widely different uh, fleets nowadays of all vehicles, including electric vehicles and, and non electric vehicles. But also in the electric vehicle fleet specifically, they also show differences. For example, we see that in Vietnam, um, a large share of the vehicles, both in all vehicles and also all the electric vehicles, uh, correspond to two wheelers. And then the minority of the other vehicles, the, the, the rest of the vehicles are, are uh, just the minority over the total share. Uh, for example, we see in Africa, uh, both in Africa and South Africa, we see that uh, passenger light duty vehicles or simply cars, um, they play a bigger role than in other countries such as India and Vietnam. Uh, with also some role played by, for example, two-wheelers such as scooters um, or motorcycles, for example. And then also there is a share of um, medium and heavy-duty trucks uh, and vans. Now, uh, talking about EVs, at least this is the uh, estimates that we have uh, for a recent year. In the case of Africa, we see that, that despite uh, that we see that in total vehicles, there's a, a more distributed share between different types in the case of EVs, the deployment up to this day has been mostly regarding cars and also in some cases to vans, which is light commercial vehicles. So we see at least temporarily a difference there and a shift uh, compared to the overall fleet, which also would include um, non-EVs. So this is important because different vehicle types and segments imply different opportunities for electric vehicle deployment and charging solutions. And therefore, it's very important for policymakers to be aware of where the country starts from. For example, the thinking of the all vehicles segment, but then also to uh, combine that information with understanding what is the current status of electric vehicles to have an idea of what actions should, should be carried out now, but also how the EV, the electric vehicle fleet could evolve in the near and longer term. So I will go just very quickly with this. Uh, in this report, we provided a, a grid integration of electric vehicles to help policymakers prioritize the measures to deploy it. And this is based on the electric vehicles that you currently have, uh, your, your network conditions, and also how the policymaker would like them to interact. So for example, we see that some countries could be in phase one where the current electric vehicle fleet uh, maybe is not enough to cause a significant impact in the power system at a local or national level, for example. So in that phase, for example, countries could encourage a higher electric vehicle uptake through incentives and also through public electric vehicle charging stations uh, deployment. And then it could be good that countries coordinate where uh, to allocate these charging stations, depending both on the demand for uh, in terms of transport uh, configuration, but also considering the capacities of the distribution uh, grid. Uh, because, if, for example, in some cases, the without even without electric vehicles, in some cases, the grid could be already very stressed. So it's very important that policymakers take into account uh, which are the points that could. Uh, sustain even more demand uh, if electric vehicles were to charge there. Then a phase two uh, would be when countries start to see a, a more noticeable uh, demand of electricity due to electric vehicle charging, uh, but still uh, without uh, a, a, a big uh, flexibility demand of electricity. So this is, uh, for example, what we see in Norway, where we already see that electric vehicles can be uh, impacting more the grid, but still, because these countries have a lot of renewables and a lot of flexibility in their system, this is not yet affecting too much. So in that case, some passive measures, namely um, measures that the users themselves can take, it's not the grid forcing them to do, uh, such as, for example, time of use tariffs, which um, define a different price of electricity through every hour, for example, they can help um, to try to accommodate uh, EV, EV charging on the moments of the day in which it could be best for the network. And then we have uh, phase three and four, which uh, relate to phases in which uh, countries could already have a more uh, significant uh, electricity demand due to electric vehicle charging. At the same time, in these cases, 
there could be um, measures in place to have that electricity demand uh, because of charging being more flexible. So in these cases, we could see, for example, that uh, countries could begin to implement some active measures. For example, active refers to measures where the charging is controlled. So there's an agreement uh, to, for example, so the users let the, the, the system of charging to control when they charge. So in this case, this can be beneficial to uh, try to match uh, the charging uh, to whenever the, the power system demand is lower and therefore to reduce the, the impact. All of these recommendations, you can read them in more detail in the report, which is called the Grid Integration of Electric Vehicles and Website. So I will now, uh, before I go to the tool, uh, I will have a, a menti question for you. So please uh, go to menti.com and use the code that I'm showing there. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, uh, the global electric vehicle electricity demand as of 2022 equals to total national electricity consumption of which of these four options? Okay, so we have uh, some people that say it's eight times Ethiopia, which would be 110 terawatt hours per year. Some people say it could be same as the United Kingdom, 300 terawatt hours. And at least until now, no people, no per no person thinks it's the same national consumption. Ah, well, now now one person thinks <laughs> that it's a equal to Japan. Uh, and yeah, up to now nobody thinks it's one third of South African demand. I will leave a, a, a bit of time for you to reply, and then I will reveal the, the, the answer to this question. Okay, yeah. Due to the time, I, I will just uh, answer the, the, the question now. So actually the majority here of the respondents got it right. Maybe the Africa reference, because we put an African country as the correct answer gave us away, but yeah, uh, the according to IA estimates of 2022, the global electricity demand uh, due to electric vehicle charging amounted to 110 terawatt hours, which is eight times the uh, demand of Ethiopia. Okay, now I'll, I'll continue with the EV charging tool and I will give some context and I will also do this. So, let me begin explaining the motivation. The idea of this tool is to be a companion uh, of the manual I just explained about. And the idea of this tool is to, in practice, help policymakers but also, for example, pilot project developers, general public, academics, industry members, and whoever could be interested uh, to make the link between electric vehicles and also what electricity demand they could have. Um, and this could enable uh, whoever is using this tool to assess the impact of electric vehicles on power systems. So this tool has three main goals and motivations. The first one, uh, which is the base uh, model would be to assess the impact of electric vehicle charging on the power system. And this is done uh, computing a simulation of the electric vehicle charging behavior, which has as an output, the weekly electric vehicle charging demand profile. The second and third uh, models actually uh, were under development and for this event are already available in our website. So you can also uh, use and simulate with them uh, whenever you want. The number two, it refers to assessing the effects of measures for mitigating 
the electric vehicle charging impacts. So basically, with this, we, we try to understand which uh, methods we, we could use to uh, reduce the impacts of, uh, for example, peaks of electricity demand created by electric vehicle charging. So this is done by a simulation of different uh, profiles when we use managed, or we could also say smarter charging. And the third module, which, are, as I was saying, was also just released in the tool, uh, is aiming to calculate or estimate the CO2 emissions that are directly attributable to electric vehicle charging. So basically, the tool simulates an electricity mix or a power system. And then with that, and with the electricity demand profile estimated because of the electric vehicle fleet, it calculates which are the emissions that are specifically due uh, to the charging of electric vehicles. So now I will go to the tool and show you uh, first through the results, what it gives, and then I will show you how to get there and also to show uh, a lot of examples. Here. Okay. So basically, well, as I was saying, what we simulate with this tool um, is a weekly electricity demand profile. And this goes in five minute intervals. So it's, it has a very high resolution so that you can have a lot of detail in your simulation. And this shows what demand is caused directly by electric vehicle charging. So here I, I am in the link um, that I showed, but also you can Google the electric vehicle charging and grid integration tool and you will find the here this link in the IA website. Um, so here I'm starting with the results tab. Um, just to show you where we will get that. And then as I was saying, I will show you how to get there. So this tool shows the weekly demand profile. Uh, this can be seen, for example, in several charging locations. So for example, we can have a charging location that relates to um, charging at the workplace, charging at home, uh, charging at the roadside, for example, in a public parking lot that has chargers. So this can allow the users to see, uh, for example, the, the hourly profile by location. And also if you have different uh, fleets, you can see it by segment here in this tab. You can see the emissions there, which I will show at the last bit of my presentation. Uh, and also you can uh, assess indicators such as, for example, the maximum peak in that week of power demand. In this case, it will be 101 kilowatts. Uh, the average demand over the week, how much energy it consumes over the week and, and estimate based on that for the year. Um, and you, you can also here download the data if you want to do some further analysis with it. That's also a possibility. With this, uh, you can uh, make several use cases for several stakeholders, for example, uh, potential users can be policymakers and utilities who would like to know whether the grid's in capacity or the generation capacity needs any upgrade, for example, in the transformer capacity or even in the power plant capacity to accommodate a certain number uh, of electric vehicles. Uh, policymakers and academics can also study trade-offs between different charging schemes and fleet behavior. Um, also, for example, pilot project developers can use it to provide a preliminary assessment of electricity demand curves that could be uh, associated to their test system. And that way they could have an idea of uh, if the network uh, location where they plan to uh, allocate the charging station is uh, enough, has enough capacity for their uh, fleet, or if they maybe could uh, need to ask for an upgrade in, for example, the transformer capacity in that uh, part. I'll go back to the slide. So I will first begin with some context and then I will show a, a bit more how to get to that result I showed. So basically, there are several types of charging locations and I will go through them just uh, very quickly for a reference. For, for example, you would have charging locations at residential neighborhoods, uh, namely home charging. If you have a fleet of buses or truck, you could also have a depot where you normally leave these vehicles. That's what, what we call depot charging. Um, then, for example, if you're moving from one city to the other, you, or uh, for example, in a gas station that also has uh, electric, electric chargers, you would have what we call en route charging, which normally has higher power because the people stop there 
very quickly just to charge and continue. So it normally has higher power uh, than at home. Um, for example, you can also do battery swapping in uh, electric scooters. That's also is a possibility. Uh, you can also have workplace charging. Uh, for example, you just if you happen to go to your workplace with a car, uh, some workplaces can also have chargers in there, and then you can leave your car charging while you work, and then pick it up when you are, are done with work. Um, so, just these are just some examples that show. Uh, that charging can be done at several locations, and these locations many times can pose different challenges to the grid. Yeah. Uh, and I will go in more detail to that um, in next the parts of my presentation. So many factors influence the profile of demand of electric vehicles on the grid. Um, for example, in terms of grid impacts, we are mostly concerned about the amount of power that the electric vehicle charging uh, demands. So we could see that, for example, end route charging, as I was saying, um, is uh, many times the one with the highest power. As it draws the highest uh, power from the system, it would um, potentially have the highest impact, whereas some other locations that normally have a lower charging rate, such as, for example, workplace uh, or destination charging, for example, they normally have a lower impact. So, it's very important for policymakers and, as I was saying, whatever user uh, is interested to simulate the demand, to be aware of these impacts in order to plan for their system in the best way possible. Go back to the tool and show you an example of 100 buses. So this is being inspired by many cities in the world, including some in Africa, that are either planning or actually already have begun deploying some electric buses um, in their area. So, as I was saying, this is a tool that you can find on the website. I will just refresh to make a clean start. Um, so basically, I will first show the, the tabs. Uh, here you have the tab that is called Fleet. Here you can put whatever uh, label you want and you can just write bus. Um, then I have to select the bus here. I can select the stock, which is basically the size of the fleet, 100. And normally for bus, you would select private driving here in the bottom. There's other parameters such as average battery capacity, energy consumption, and average weekday driving and weekend driving that you can modify to make it suit uh, the best way possible to your local context. And by the way, you also have here a full technical note explaining how to use the tool and all of the features it has. So, okay, we have the fleet. I will just have a fleet of 100 buses. Then I go to behavior profiles. Uh, this has, for example, information of the availability of charging solutions uh, for the fleets. So for example, here uh, we would have uh, the availability uh, in weekdays and also weekends of 90% of depot charging in the case for, for buses. So this means that normally 90% uh, of the bus drivers will have access to, to this um, in a certain moment. Um, and it's the same way for the other uh, locations that you can change both the availability and also the default power that if you want to modify to a different uh, rate. You can also, for example, here, uh, all of uh, these uh, characteristics have values by default, but you can also, for example, here, you can define kind of an average arrival time of the bus with some variance. Um, for example, at 8 p.m. and normally stays 12 hours, but you can modify this for weekdays as much as you like to make it best suit your local context. So now on the results. So here we can see the effect that 10 buses, oh, sorry, 100 buses could have. So for example, we can see them by segment or by location. There is only one segment here. And so I will just um, explain this one. Um, basically we have this profile. So 100 buses could mean potentially a peak demand of almost uh, 2000 kilowatts or two megawatts. So it can begin to be a sizable demand of electricity. And we can see that normally the charging tends to happen more at night, which is when the buses uh, come back to the depot uh, on average, be charged and also just to be deployed there until they leave again to, to their um, driving patterns in the next day. So here, as I was saying, um, you can download the data, you can assess it uh, here. 
Um, and you can also see several indicators here on the right, in the upper right corner. Now I will continue with another uh, problem is because we see that in many cases in Africa uh, there's a the, the share of electric vehicles is high for cars. So I will do a start again of the tool, uh, and I will now do a fleet of cars. So basically, here I select vehicle type, uh, light duty vehicle, uh, uh, which refers to cars. Then I select just 1,000, and I will leave it uh, default. And all of the other parameters will be left default. So now I will go to the results and show the difference. So we can see here that um, as opposed to the buses, um, normally people, when they come back with the car, they come back from work, so around six or seven. But again, you can modify this. But by default, they come by, more or less by six or seven back to, to their homes. So in the bus case, we would see that uh, the charging had a peak um, around uh, eight or nine. But in this case, because of the behavior, um, this fleet of cars would have um, a, a peak of the charging that is a bit earlier in the day. And this could also potentially be an issue uh, for the, the system operators because in these both cases that I've showed, the peaks are at seven or onwards, which is also when normally, for example, solar PV generation is not there. So if we would have uh, a big deployment of electric vehicles with this demand profile, we could maybe have an uh, extra stress in the system because at those times, it could be possible that there's no solar photovoltaic generation available. So in that case, it could be necessary to um, a fire or increase the power output of, for example, a coal power plant. And this could mean more uh, emissions and, and a higher price, which are, of course, effects that we would like to avoid. Now, as I was saying, you can also, with this tool model, overlap, overlapping or different uh, fleets combined together. So, for example, you can combine these 1,000 cars with the original buses I showed. So, for example, here, we can have 100 buses with driving, and then we go to the results. And then what we see here is that if we go to the by segment uh, part, we can see that um, basically see, see that uh, what, what I was describing, that normally cars tend to have a peak earlier and then uh, buses later. And then both of them combined could have a significant total demand that could put the system into stress. You can also, for example, here in this by location tab, see, uh, for example, uh, for the total combined fleet, where this charging is taking place. Here we see that most of, is, most of it is in the case of cars at home and in the case of buses in their depot, but also there is some level here in dark blue of charging in the workplace, um, which is, as you can see, closer to midday, more or less, and also some occasional charging in other places, for example, uh, roadside charging or namely a public parking lot. Well, we'll go back to the presentation a bit to give context on the second uh, model. So this model now uh, is about implementing an, a managed or more flexible charging scheme. Um, this is because as policymakers and the overall public would be interested to go from challenges of grid impacts uh, to opportunities uh, that can be opened by um, flexible or managed charging. So for example, we see that uh, if we have enough, enough uh, systems and also architectures in place, we could um, avoid having such a big impact in some distribution networks. Uh, if we, for example, can in somehow uh, decrease the peaks of electricity uh, demand because of charging or also maybe potentially move them to different times of the day in which they could have a lower impact on the grid. So first I will explain the concept of managed charging uh, as opposed to unmanaged. Here, and please uh, here look at the upper uh, right corner of my slide. So unmanaged charging uh, would refer in this case to the case in which you basically just arrive with your vehicle, you connect it to the charging station, and regardless of 
if you will stay one full day, the charging uh, power is at maximum connected to your vehicle until the battery is full and then it just stops. So that would be the unmanaged case. The managed case, on the other hand, is a case in which the because of various schemes we could use, um, the charging uh, tries to take advantage of, for example, if you leave the vehicle there a long time. So, for example, if you leave a, a long time the, the vehicle there in the parking lot, by using less power, but for more time, you could in the end have the same amount of energy, so your battery could still be charged. But if you do it in a longer time with low power, then in that case, you would stress the network, the electricity network less. So this is, um, for example, what we call balanced charging uh, is basically having a lower uh, average uh, charging power for the whole time in which you leave the vehicle. And that way, uh, the charging power is less and therefore the impact on the grid is lower than if you just connect it and have it at full power, um, even if you wouldn't need that charging speed, um, depending on the case. So that is one way of managed or smart charging. That would be the balanced case in which you basically, uh, for the whole time in which you leave the vehicle, you have a lower um, uh, charging power utilized. But you can also use some other measures, such as, for example, time of use, which is basically that uh, the electric vehicle uh, would see a different price of electricity each hour, and therefore it would respond to that by moving the charging whenever possible to a lower price time. And also we could have uh, what we call vehicle to grid or V1G, which uh, in which case, instead of a price and each hour, the charging is influenced by the level of electricity demand in the whole system. So the charging there would try to accommodate to move as much as possible to times in which the load of the power system or the demand of electricity of the whole power system is the lowest to try to minimize the total impact of electric vehicle charging. So now I'll, I'll go back to my example of 1000 cars and show the impact of balance. So I will again just reset. So here cars. Okay, so this is the base case. We see that the peak is more or less 960 kilowatts, and this is unmanaged by default. The tool provides unmanaged charging. Um, and then I can activate the balanced version, which is one of the uh, managed strategies here in the advanced options tab. So if you remember, I was showing that the peak without balanced charging was almost 1000 kilowatts. Here you see that with balanced, we decrease the peaks to less than 600 kilowatts. Um, and with this, the, the profile of charging is on average a bit higher probably, uh, or at least on, a, on the lower levels are a bit higher than in the other case. But the highest point of demand is not as high, and that can help uh, to de decrease the electricity demand uh, in peak times and therefore can help decrease the impact on the power grid. Now, I will show what happens if we use time of use tariffs. So here in the same tab, advanced options, you can go to the time of use tariffs here. Can you say just a second? Yeah, sorry, I just had an issue with my computer. I will be back just in a second. Yeah, sorry about that. I had an issue with my computer, but I'm here. I will share my screen again.
Yeah, okay. So now I will go back to what I was showing here. So basically, uh, time of use tariffs. So yeah, we have here as an input the daily tariff structure uh, that you can modify yourself. For example, you can grab this and modify either one specific point of the uh, daily tariff uh, uh, schedule, or also you can grab this uh, like in several cases, for example, like this. Uh, and that way you can also yourself um, modify uh, what kind of profile is an input for this kind of scheme. So we have here that the, the price is normally lowest at night time when there's less demand, and then it begins to increase, reaching a peak uh, around uh, after 4 or 5 p.m. until more or less 10 p.m. when it begins to decrease again. So let's see what impact this has on the charging. So what we see here, give us a second, bring this back to cars. Okay. So what we see here is an interesting impact. We see that before, uh, without time of use tariffs for cars, uh, what we had was a peak around seven or eight, but because this tariff uh, has the lowest point here after 9 p.m., we see that the, there is a shift um, in this case on the results, which go uh, to the result that the peak now, instead of at 6 or 7 p.m., with this kind of charging scheme, is around midnight, which is when the price is lowest. So this shows that, in practice, the, the charging profile can, in practice, be influenced by the time of use tariff. So with this, you can simulate what kind of impact all of these different uh, daily or hourly prices you can set uh, could um, affect the, um, the, the charging profile. Now we'll also show another case, um, which is the uh, B1G, uh, which is the basically active control with any directional charging, vehicle to grid. Um, so basically here the signal that the charging responds to is not the price, but the demand of the system. So in this case, if you go to the power grid tab, if you go down here, you see the uh, power system uh, uh, demand curve by each hour of a week. You can also modify this either by dragging this or by updating a file that would have the demand of your own area of in interest. So then with this, this is the profile that will influence the uh, signal that will be given to the charging in this case of the B1G uh, scheme. So basically what we see here is that uh, as normally happens, the demand is lowest here in the um, uh, evenings and nights of the weekends. So what we will see is normally a shift uh, that um, will happen uh, and we will have uh, higher peaks in the weekends than on the week. Yes. So here we can see that the demand, uh, the charging behavior in this case, because of this charging scheme, is effectively influenced uh, by when the uh, non-electric vehicle demand is highest, or lowest actually, because under this scheme, the aim is to reduce the total, uh, which is the non-electric vehicle plus electric vehicle demand. So in this case, as the demand of the rest of the system is already lower in these moments of the weekend, on the evenings and nights, then these charging schemes accommodate the EV demand to the points, uh, whenever possible, to the points in which the system demand is, is lowest. So this will work. Okay, I will go back to my presentation in just a second.
Okay, yeah, here we are back. So this last module is about, uh, and it's also, as I was saying, available in the in the tool, is about, um, it's, it's about estimating the CO2 emissions rate uh, directly attributable or related to EV charging. So first I will explain the logic of this and then I will show it in the tool so that you can have an idea of how it works. So in this case, how does the tool estimate the emissions? The idea of the tool in this case is to estimate the emissions that are directly due uh, to electric vehicle charging and not because of any other reason. And how does the tool model that? Basically, this is done uh, calculating first the net load, which is basically the total demand minus the renewable generation, uh, for example, solar photovoltaic or wind power. Um, so that one is calculated in the case without and also in the case with electric vehicle charging. Then for both cases, the tool uh, simulates uh, what is called an economic dispatch or basically an algorithm to, to operate a simplified uh, power system to see which plants would be operating to meet that net load. And then by comparing the emissions in the case with and in the case without um, ele uh, electric vehicle charging, then the tool comes up with an estimate of what are the carbon dioxide emissions that are directly because of um, uh, charging electric vehicles. So basically, here on the right, we see a, a small diagram uh, that uh, here in the lightning sign, it, this uh, shows the cumulative, cumulative power sum, uh, basically the, the total demand at that moment. Uh, and then the, the money sign, it would be the uh, energy price of each power plant. So basically uh, what it shows is that in some cases, um, the higher the demand, it could be necessary depending on the power system to fire an additional power plant that could be uh, more expensive than the previous one. Uh, so because of this, uh, uh, having more demand of electricity could result many times into having higher uh, both emissions because of firing more emitting plants, but also higher prices because sometimes just to meet a bit of extra demand, you cannot uh, generate enough with the current active fleet. In many, some of these cases, you may have to, to turn on an additional plant that could be more expensive and also have uh, more CO2 emissions. So I will go back to the tool here. And I will, after this, I will take all your questions um, and, and then you know, yeah. go to that section. So, okay, I will just reset it to, to make a clean start again. Here, I will continue as always with the cars example. So LDB is 1,000 uh, 1, cars. Um, I will not use any smart charging. I will just illustrate how uh, the emissions calculations work. So basically here, um, I will uh, just show that you can define here and accommodate to your specific case uh, on area. Uh, as I was saying, because the emissions depend directly on the electricity mix, the, uh, which plants the area has. Here you can define, for example, the prices uh, of each generation type, its capacity, um, what emissions it produces uh, per energy unit generated and so on. So in this case, you can modify this um, to have the most accurate uh, estimate possible that is also suited to the area you are modeling, whether if it's a small country, a big country, a region, or whatever that is in your intention to, to model. So here, basically, then we'll just go to results and go to the emissions tab. So with this, um, this shows the total emissions, including uh, electric vehicles. And here we see, I mean, we, we can also, if you want, we can show the non-EV emissions, which in the default system are a lot higher than the uh, uh, emissions we have by EVs. So focusing on the emissions directly related to um, electric vehicles, we also have here a weekly curve uh, that has the same resolution as for the electricity demand. You can here download the data. You can see which is the estimate of uh, marginal EV 
uh, electric vehicle emissions because of electric vehicle charging by week. Um, and also you can, with that, provide an estimate of, for the test system that you are modeling, uh, how much emissions this could mean uh, in a whole year if we assume that this weekly profile holds for the whole year. So with that, um, you can effectively um, estimate the emissions uh, because of the electric vehicle charging. Um, and this, therefore, if you combine it with all of the other features of the tool, uh, for example, different charging schemes or different kinds of fleet or behaviors, you can assess trade-offs between um, different measures in terms of emissions and also in terms of electricity demand, both of which provide results that can be seen in charts and also that can be downloaded as data files uh, for any user who is interested to assess these results. So with that, and again, uh, apologies for technical issues, I will finish the, the live demo and I will go on to answer the questions you have in the Q&A. Okay, I have here the first question would be, what's the impact of integrating renewables, particularly solar on the grid to manage EV charging demand? So I think here, if I understood the, the question correctly, um, I think uh, this could be seen in a, in a different way. So um, actually what we have shown in our analysis and our recommendation is that you can, uh, if you have flexible uh, charging in, in place, you can actually sometimes integrate more variable renewables uh, depending on the day. So why is this? This is because, for example, in some power systems we have seen in the world, uh, what happens sometimes is this uh, excess renewable generation, for example, because of wind or solar photovoltaic generation being too high at times. Um, sometimes this generation is uh, curtailed, basically, the system cannot take that extra generation and some of the output is lost. So sometimes if this happens, having flexible demand would mean that if you are aware that the generation is very high at some point, the availability of solar photovoltaic resource is very high at some point, then you could, if you have flexibility on the charging side, you could increase uh, or shift the charging of your electric vehicle to those moments. And that way you could avoid that electricity being lost. Uh, so in that case, uh, of course, other solutions could include uh, battery storage, but in the context we're looking at now, which is electric vehicle charging, if you have that in place, you could actually increase the integration of, electric, uh, of, of variable renewables. And um, if you are able to allocate that uh, demand to a time of the day in which the uh, renewable generation is higher or at, it, at its highest. Thank you. Yeah, I also have a question here that is about an option about uh, geothermal energy generation. Uh, I, I will just go, show a bit more that the part of the tool will, where will you can define your um, generation fleet. Just a second. Okay. So, yeah. so here, this is just a default, uh, a default um, me, uh, combination of uh, power plants. Uh, so by default, the system has 250 megawatts of coal fired power generation with a certain price that you can modify, and also some emissions. This has some var uh, variability because then the, the simulation tool um, generates uh, a random uh, uh, variable to modify and generate different smaller plants uh, to, to simulate a bit more uh, a, a smaller system that could have different plants with slightly different prices and slightly different emissions factors. Um, so by default, the tool comes with a coal and oil 
a gas, a solar PV, uh, wind onshore, and a hydro plant. But you can also modify this to your own system by, for example, deleting any of these plants. You can delete the hydro, for example. You can modify the type. So here we have these types, a coal, oil, gas, um, a combined cycle of gas, for example, and a nuclear, solar PV, wind, and hydro. Um, we don't have yet specifically a bioenergy plant, although you could maybe try to replicate it by modifying the price uh, and the emissions factor of the gas. Uh, but definitely this is a, a good suggestion. So we will see in the future if we can also add um, a bioenergy um, type of plant so that you can also add it if it reflects better uh, your system. But as I was saying, I think you could do a quite decent approximation of that uh, by modifying the price uh, and the emissions uh, per energy generated accordingly to make it follow as best as possible the bioenergy um, plant. Thanks. Okay, so we also have a question uh, similar to the question that was directed to, to Shane on, his, on the tool he presented. Uh, that is about if there's any possibility to add other currencies to the, to the tool. Um, in this case, my answer will be similar. So the idea of this is to understand um, trade-offs. Um, so uh, basically, if proportionally, uh, a power plant is a bit more expensive than the other one. For example, now that we are talking about the uh, electricity mix simulation and the emissions. Um, Regardless of the currency, if one plant is more expensive than the other one, if the uh, algorithm needs to see uh, which uh, plant it will use to meet that extra demand, it will always go for the cheaper one. So, um, so in, in, in those terms, the algorithm uh, shouldn't be affected by the currency you use. Okay, thank you for the question. I hope I answered it, but please, if I didn't uh, answer it uh, enough, you can uh, put another question and I will do my best. Here, we also have another question that says whether it's possible to feed the data from the tool uh, to a sol solar modeling tool, uh, such as Homer. Um, I am not uh, personally familiar with that tool you, you mentioned, but um, what, what you can do as I was showing with the tool, is you can get the results. Um, basically, you can download uh, data as CSV files. So what you can do is to manually set, if you, for example, if you want to simulate several, several cases or scenarios, you can modify uh, and do as many simulations as you, as you want. Download all of, those, um, all of those data files of the results, uh, for example, by segment or um, my location, um, and then with that you can simulate. Uh, if what you want is to input data, in, in these cases, for example, what we have um, currently available until now is uh, to modify either here if, through the use of this dragging function I showed you. For example, you can modify here the demand um, or uploading, uh, uploading a, a file of the demand. Um, and that uh, here you can see like the simulation of the generation mix. So if you would like to feed the, the, the tool with data, for example, of the uh, solar photovoltaic generation profile, that is uh, not yet available. That is a, a function that we are thinking of deploying um, because we understand that uh, it would give the users um, still even more flexibility to modify the results. Uh, but uh, up to now, you can only use the the fund profile that we have here for solar PV generation, which you can use, you can uh, check here. If you select all of the other ones, you can just leave the profile here. So this default profile um, it begins to provide energy of solar PV more or less at um, 7 a.m. and then it reaches its peak around midday and then it goes um, back down more or less at 5.30 or 6 p.m. So we chose this profile because we thought it was representative enough of many countries that have solar PV generation. Um, 
But we definitely are, are working and we plan at some point in the future to allow users to also modify the profile so that they can better reflect the local context of uh, the availability of um, electricity from solar photovoltaic. Okay, I will now go on with the other questions. Let's see. Okay, uh, here, I think the last question that I have to answer up to now, based on the questions I see in the Q&A, is uh, whether most grid and charging station systems are equipped for B1G to be implemented, uh, and if not, what and when it will take. Um, basically, uh, this is not always the case. Uh, this is because the infrastructure has to be in place, so the charging stations need to have uh, communication protocols available in, in their equipment. Um, you can read in our report the, about grid integration of electric vehicles, the policy manual report I mentioned. You can read there some examples we, we list. Uh, but so uh, up to this point, just as a summary, um, this is not something that is very widespread or implemented. This is in many cases on the piloting phase, on the demonstration phase of this B1G or active con uh, grid control uh, charging uh, scheme. So. This is not yet available at scale in many cases. And so if you want to see what, what is the, um, the progress, for example, on these pilot projects, I would suggest to check the report. Um, and then you can see some specific examples of where this has been done and what the key lessons learned are, and also how uh, these pilots uh, performed. OK. Okay, I don't see any more uh, an open questions that I I will reply now. So um, please be aware that if there's any question that you had that we didn't reply today, or maybe a, a question that will come up later, feel free to email us as, as um, Shane and myself were showing. Uh, in the case of the working group where Shane is participating, um, the email is jeff.immobility.wg one at ia.org. And in the case of um, the working group that is related to EV charging, this is uh, gef.emobility.wg4 at ia.org. So with that, uh, please feel free to give us any feedback or send us any questions you may have, and we will be happy to, to answer it. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I think after checking all the Q&A questions, uh, I would like again to thank all of you for your participation in this event. I would like to thank also uh, all of my colleagues uh, here at the IA side who have been helping me uh, um, both uh, prepare the new features of the tool and also the colleagues that helped in um, organizing this event. And also Annika Bellin and all of her colleagues who helped us uh, from the Africa platform to prepare um, this event and to ensure that it reached all of the possible stakeholders that are interested in, in this topic. So we are very happy to have had your participation today. We had over 100 participants, which is something that makes us very happy and very proud. And we're looking forward to having uh, more uh, collaboration with you. Just a few notes before closing. So we will send you a survey uh, to get feedback from this event, uh, which will come later. Um, and also if you have any material on electric vehicle developments that you would like to share with us, please feel free to send it to us through the emails that we share. Also, lastly, we will, as I was saying, update, uh, upload this uh, recording to the website. Uh, and you can find the this event page on the IA website, which is www.iea.org. There you can find not only this event, but also all of the other reports and events and analysis we have produced at the IA, which would, we would be very happy to have you check um, so that you can uh, be informed of our work. 
So with that, I would like to thank you again for your participation and, and your questions today. And just let me finish by saying that we would love to see you again in future events. So many thanks and have a great day.